glad to see another full room here uh, tonight. I'm Gay Nicholson. I'm president of Sustainable Tompkins, and uh, we have been putting on this uh, spring people salon, uh, conversations that matter to our future. And the theme has been the climate, the market, and the commons. Uh, the first salon that we did back in April was on why are we stuck in climate denial? And uh, you know, we all know science tells us that we must do more, a lot more, and quickly. And yet, we seem to be so stuck in denial, so slow to react. So that first line explored all those different uh, reasons behind um, the denial phenomenon. And then the second salon in May was on the role of business and technology. You know, it does seem like there's a lot of opportunity for jobs and for, um, you know, for businesses to uh, seek new markets in the uh, arena of clean technologies, clean energy technologies. But market conditions have been pretty difficult and kind of a seesaw. And, and then lately, we've been seeing quite a bit of pushback from the uh, fossil fuel industry. So we've, we're really sort of engaging in a real battle uh, right now. Uh, by the way, those first two salons are available uh, as videos or podcasts, and you can find the links on our website. Um, now tonight, uh, the topic tonight is, will government intervene? Um, what should be the role of government in terms of uh, regulating the market and protecting the commons when it comes to climate and a lot of other things? <laughs> But I, we ask the question because it seems like regulatory control is going to be absolutely essential to convince the dirty energy interest to leave the fossil fuel in the ground. Um, we know from the climate science that it needs to be left in the ground and it can't be burned or we're going to pay such a price um, in terms of catastrophic climate damage. And we all know that we've had some sporadic efforts by states, by nations, uh, to address the climate issues, but in, in general, it seems like we're facing a problem of captured government, as they call it, captured by business interests. Um, Francis Moore LaPay uh, calls it privately owned government, where, um, where industries not only control votes by politicians through their campaign contributions, but they're even writing the legislation themselves. That's a real problem. Um, the citizens around the entire world are extremely vulnerable, um, both directly and indirectly, and yet we're the ones that are being asked to pay the full costs of dirty energy and climate change, even as huge profits are funneling up to the owners of the fossil fuel interests. We're looking at the, the cost of the damage itself, drought, fire, you know, wind, flood, um, all those uh, extreme energy, uh, extreme weather events. We're looking at the cost of hardening our public infrastructure uh, against climate change. The whole ad adaptation bill could be pretty significant. And we're looking at the cost of helping the most vulnerable in our communities, as well as coping with refugees from um, places that are hit hard by climate change. And now we're even looking at the cost of lawsuits against our governments for failure to take action. Um, you may have heard that Farmers Insurance recently sued 200 Chicago area local governments for damage from a big uh, rainstorm in April of 2013. Uh, because they acknowledged that there was a climate problem in their, in their climate action plans but had failed to take action yet. Uh, and even though they knew that they had a problem with stormwater runoff and uh, sewer uh, overflow. So um, now the insurance companies don't want to have to pay that bill, so they're asking the taxpayers to pay that bill. And we can expect more of that. We know from the insurance industry that not only will we be paying higher premiums and not being able to get coverage, but they'll be looking for somebody else <coughs> to, to, to take the bill. Um, and. But the governments are not only vulnerable for lawsuits for failing to take action, but if they do take action, I'm, you know, we all have been listening to the news this week of um, Obama's initiative for um, emission controls from power plants. 
and coal industry threatening to sue the EPA uh, for that. So, you know, we know we're in a uh, we're in quite a struggle uh, these days that we need to to figure out how we're going to cope with it. So tonight, um, we're going to start with a review of what our various levels of government could be doing, what's possible at the local, the state, and the federal level uh, to deal with this global problem that hits locally. And um, we're so pleased to have as our respondents tonight um, um, guests that probably don't need any introduction to you, <laughs> but we'll start with, we have Savanti Myrick, our mayor of Ithaca. Always a pleasure to have Savanti with us, and he'll be speaking about local governments, and our assemblywoman, Barbara Lifton, who of course will be speaking about the state level, and Professor Tony Ingrafia, who's representing the feds tonight, even though he doesn't have his uncle. <laughs> Where's your uncle? I thought he was gonna wear an Uncle Sam hat to fill in for the feds since. Yeah. We kind of didn't think our congressman would be likely to um, talk about this too well. <laughs> so um, after they introduce that, then we're going to open it up for the salon part of the conversation. Um, and we're going to be spending some time with these admittedly very, very large questions that are on the sheets. Um, and you may wonder what this, you know, what these have to do with the topic of government's role in climate change, but I believe that they're, they're really fundamental to our situation and our need to reclaim our democracy if we're going to successfully cope with climate disruption. It seems to me that um, actually having a democracy is just going to be essential. So w first question is, you know, where can we get some traction? Where, um, where is there some leverage at each of these levels of government? And then um, I'd like us to talk about um, how do we address the cultural and political ideology that has grown, especially since the Reagan and Thatcher era, in which government is bad and needs to be, you know, shrunk. Um, its its role is is uh, denigrated, and the whole notion of the public good seems to have faded from view and been replaced by elevating the idea of individual rights. Um, and substituting those for the public good. So I, I think we need to spend some time dealing with that because there's a lot of people who, who seem to be buying into that ideology. And then uh, lastly, um, what can be done um, to, by government to reform the economy and how it works, how our version of capitalism is working these days. Or so, where the wealth is funneled to the few, how can we make um, the cost be actually internalized to businesses and the benefits and the risks much more fairly shared, both within our generations and um, across generations, uh, the people of the future? That's um, an incredibly important question that tends to be ignored politically. But before we get into that, just uh, some announcements and a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first, I want to thank, again, Home Green Home for their sponsorship of the videotaping um, by Chris Bacanke and Bill Houston and Eddie Rodriguez. It's been so wonderful to have you guys doing this for us. And I uh, wanted to also thank Ithaca Bakery for um, for donating the catering tonight. Really appreciate that, too. And uh, of course, our uh, Sustainability Center um, for hosting us tonight. And there's a couple of the board members in the back, Philly and Nick. Um, and uh, also, just uh, ongoing thanks to Park Foundation and our members for, for their support. Um, and speaking of support, one of our board members, Miranda Phillips, uh, wanted to. Testing? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to thank you on behalf of the Board of Sustainable Tompkins, because uh, this is a, a program of Sustainable Tompkins, um, and to send big appreciations um, to our panelists um, for being part of this. I know you 
you have a lot going on, um, and uh, and it's really huge for us that you're here um, uh, to to share your wisdom and to to collect your wisdom. Because how often are is this group of people together? Um, and to Gay, um, for the, she wouldn't tell you herself, but uh, it's, it takes a huge amount of work and thoughtfulness to craft a container that can hold all of the opinions that will be shared tonight. Um, and the past salons, if you haven't been to them, have been really, uh, for me, wonderful. Because I, um, even though I'm a board member of Sustainable Tompkins, I think about this stuff all the time. Um, precisely because I think about this stuff all the time, it can, um, uh, it's such a rare opportunity to have everybody else sharing what is going on in your, you know, uh, personal musings. And, um, and when we put all those together, that's when we can better uh, act quickly and wisely. Um, so uh, I wanted to, uh, to encourage you, as Gay said, the Park Foundation, we're very lucky that they support us, they support us largely, but on purpose they don't fund us fully so that we will be pushed to ask you to, uh, to give, and that is um, to invest in what you value. Um, we know that not everyone can give, um, but if you uh, appreciate these kinds of conversations and other programs of Sustainable Tompkins, it's with your support that those can continue. There are um, the most sustainable way to support us is with a, a yearly membership, and you can pick up forms at the back um, or find find that information online. Um, there are also baskets around the room for um, giving uh, whatever you can is really valuable for us. So thank you so much. And now, what you what you've come here for? <laughs> Thanks. Um, but this is this is part of it too. This is what makes this possible. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Appreciate that. I guess uh, back to. So um, I'll just briefly go over again, since there are new faces, uh, how a salon works. And you'll see I have some basic, simple agreements I've put up here that I borrowed from Vicki Robin, who started the Conversation Cafe after 9-11. And they're pretty simple. The first is just open-mindedness of um, it's a large group. Listen, um, listen and learn from each other. Um, Second, related to that is acceptance, suspending judgment, um, and uh, really trying to listen deeply as best you can. Curiosity is good. We all have a tendency to want to sort of be formulating our reply, um, you know, to um, persuade around our point of view. But um, if we're curious about somebody else's reality, uh, that will help us listen, I think. And then the last one is brevity. With such a large crowd, uh, we, we want you to go deep and be honest, but um, to share the airspace, so to be mindful of uh, how long you're talking. And um, uh, when we um, get into the salon, uh, if you have already spoken and you have your hand up and you're in the queue, but somebody who hasn't talked yet uh, is... Um, you know, also wanting to talk, I'll, I'll put them in front of you just so that we make sure everybody gets a chance. And then I'm going to save 10 minutes at the end um, for any announcements. So if you've got other things that are coming up that are related to this that you'd like to share with the group, please do so, do so and we'll, we'll do that at the very end. So, um, so to get us started, to help us frame this up, and again, we're not looking for a specific answer. We're just exploring this incredibly important topic that's so complex, and, uh, and yet we need to wrap our heads around it so that we can get more fully to work on it together. So to frame it up, our respondents are, we're going to start with Fonte at the local level, who's, um, and then Barbara at the state, and then Tony at the uh, federal level, national level, of what could we be doing? Uh, what could government be doing at those levels to help us address climate change? Oh yes, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, that's very much appreciated. Uh, pay you for that later. Sukan <laughs> Tini, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Um, and I love those agreements: open-mindedness, acceptance, curiosity, and most of all, brevity. I may start reading those at the beginning of our city council meetings. Uh, 
Um, I think that would help us get a lot more work done. Um, and especially as, as Barbara, as the assemblywoman whispered over to me while she was reading them, she said, well, especially here in Ithaca. Uh, I, was just at a, I was just at a conference of mayors, the US conference of mayors. So there's mayors from like Seattle, the mayors from Myrtle Beach, and they have you go around and say what's different or what's interesting about being mayor in your city. And um, right before me, the mayor of Myrtle Beach said, I have 25 um, golf courses in my city. And all the mayors go, ooh. <laughs> And then I stood up and I said, uh, Ithaca was recently named the smartest city in the country. And all the mayors went, ugh. <laughs> I said, I don't know. I don't know what that means. It's not an easy thing. Uh, uh, it's not an easy thing. But we appreciate it. Yes, well, thank you. And, and, just, and just one golf course. Only one golf course. Uh, half a golf course. That's right, nine holes. See? Already, corrections. We only have half a golf course. So anyway, um, so what can, what can local governments do? Sure, sure, sure. So what can local governments do to, um, uh, I'll speak very briefly because I want to include two things. What can local governments do to prevent uh, further climate change? And what can we do to be prepared for the impacts of climate change as they continue to come? Because we're already beginning to feel them. Um, first, it's important to remember that uh, local governments aren't quite as powerful when it comes to regulating the actions of the private sector, uh, the private individuals, the corporations, or nonprofits. We can't really um, uh, meddle much uh, in terms of uh, taxing different actions or, or regulating different actions. What we do is we build and maintain infrastructure, which will become very important in the second point, what we can do to prepare. And we set land use patterns and regulations. And that's extremely important. Okay. So land use patterns, that means how, how I've kind of to think about this is where are we going to place our destinations? And how are we going to help people reach those destinations? The destination is, of course, your home. It's where you work. It's where you go to school. It's where you shop. Uh, it's where you play. It's where you learn. It's where you eat. Right? So it's a restaurant, a school, a university, a uh, city hall. All those things are destinations. What's not a destination? A highway is not a destination, right? right? It's, an, it's a means to an end. Right? And cities for too long have seen those highways, localities, in fact, it's not just localities, the state and the federal government, have seen those highways, that infrastructure, as the important thing. Now, here's the problem when you, when you treat your land use patterns that way. When you allow for sprawl by building highways to allow people to get in and out great distances very quickly. You actually you do two things. First of all, you require that people burn up a whole lot of fossil fuels getting to their destinations. Right? From work to home takes 10 minutes, 30 minutes. I have employees who work in the city of Ithaca who come from an hour away. Right? Two counties over, they drive an hour away and they drive an hour back for uh, every day, five days a week for 20 years. It's got all sorts of health problems and social problems, but pertinent to this conversation, it's got all kinds of environmental problems. What's more is that when you as a city or locality allow for that kind of sprawling development by allowing the zoning to permit it and building the infrastructure, the highways that allow it, you reduce the green space that you need to maintain, first because it captures carbon, second because, uh, and we'll get to this later, we're going to need that green space later when uh, it's no longer feasible to get your tomatoes from California. Right. So what can cities do? We can change our, um, our infrastructure investments and we can change our zoning regulations to encourage more dense, compact development. We can put our destinations closer together. Right. We can make it faster to get from your home to your work, to the park, to school, to the grocery store and back again. It was more if we put them close enough together, we can cut the, the automobile out of it entirely. Right? Because if you can get a five minute walk to the grocery store, you'll take that rather than drive it. So uh, that's what you'll see the most progressive cities do. Um, uh, New York State does not, is not actually home to the most progressive cities when it comes to land use. Um, but in the, specifically in the Pacific Northwest, you see a lot of, of cutting edge, even bleeding edge things. You can also not just change the patterns, but you can change what gets built by building requirements into your building code. Right? 
lead or lead type um, uh, requirements into every building that gets built. That will do a lot, but not as much as the first language changing the patterns. So um, that's one thing we can do to prevent it. Now, uh, what do we do with the impacts that we've already seen? I mean, we, everybody remembers the ice jams from this winter? Yeah, you remember those? Oh, you may, yeah. Um, who even, does everybody remember the ice jams? We had such weird weather this winter, such extreme colds and then wild swings and then extreme colds again, that the water was freezing as it came off the waterfall and turning into something called fran frangible ice in midair, congealing into a weird ice jelly and causing floods in February when it's minus eight degrees, right? And you know what the water does when it floods at minus eight degrees? It's essentially an ice flow pouring over the banks of your creeks and uh, into people's homes. Um, awful. I mean, it's awful. And there's no guidebook for it. I mean, there's no, there's no, um, I, they didn't teach me that in mayor orientation, right? There's no, like, there wasn't a page on that. So how do you prevent, well, you know, we learned some things. And you, you take a note now, now we know what to do. Not only do you get the cranes out and you scoop ice, but we actually took um, effluent water, water that was already treated, went through the sewage treatment plant. But because it was still warm, because it came from, came from you guys, I don't want to gross you out, but it came from you guys, so thank you for that. It was still like, it was like 50 degrees still. Um, we pumped it backwards up the creeks. It cut through the ice and created these channels. That worked uh, like a charm. Now, hopefully, we'll never have to do that again, because hopefully, that'll never happen again. But that's the insidious thing about climate change: is it, it's the climate. You don't know what form it will take in your region. We could be talking about droughts or floods. We could be talking about famine, um, uh, more severe winter storms. Though I can't imagine more severe winter storms than this year. Uh, so, what can we do? We can invest more in infrastructure that's flexible. Um, we can invest more in the infrastructure that will prevent things that we know are possible, like floods. And uh, an example of a way we're trying to do that, you might have seen in the paper over the last month that the city, that, that we, that I, am proposing that the city council pass a stormwater utility fee. This would be a fee that's applied to every property in the city, taxable and tax exempt. And uh, everybody would pay into a fund that would help keep our creek wall strong, that would help rebuild rain gutters, that would help us prepare for whatever large storm events come. And what's nice about that fee is that the larger you are and the more impervious rainwater comes off your property, the more impervious your surfaces are, so the more rainwater comes off, the more you pay. So not only do you get the worst offenders to pay, it's almost like a carbon tax, it's like a stormwater tax. Not only do you get the offenders to pay, but you create an incentive to capture that stormwater yourself. So if you're Walmart, and you now have a massive park, because they have a parking lot much, much larger than they need. Right? They like to keep it there because it's cheap for them. Right? We value the land so little, they just pave the whole thing over. And they like it to look visually like 70% of the spaces are empty because that draws people in. They say, oh, there's available parking. Now, they could do with far less of that, but why would they? Well, they would now because that parking lot's now going to cost them $15,000 per year. So now they have a financial incentive to actually recapture some of the rainwater which lowers the risk of floods for the rest of us. Another thing we can do um, to prepare for the worst is, and this is a very controversial thing in America, um, we, don't, we don't like to concede defeat uh, in this country. It's not in, our, um, it's not in our being, but we can build less in places that are likely to flood. How is that controversial? That seems like a very un-American thing, right? And people say, no, we... <laughs> Nature's not going to scare us away from where we want to live. We'll build here, and you'll say, well, it's going to flood next year. We'll build here, we'll be fine. And then you build, and they flood, and you've got to pay for it. And then farmer's insurance is suing you. And, and you've got to find a way to rebuild the infrastructure and the houses. We can actually stop that pattern, and we can discourage people from building. Now, uh, the last example is an example of something that will both prevent um, further climate change and help us be prepared for it. And that is we can um, do some things, not all things, but we can do meaningful things to make it easier for people to source what they need from closer to where they are, especially food. As I mentioned earlier, 
there will come a time when it's no longer practical to get your tomatoes from California or your oranges from, from, from Florida. Um, there will come a time when the energy costs are so high that it simply doesn't make any sense anymore. And when that time comes, whoever, whenever communities, local communities, are prepared to get more of what they need from where they live will be successful. So what are we talking about? We're talking uh, not just about farms nearby to the cities and villages, though we need that, which is why we have to stop suburban sprawl. The suburban sprawl threatens the same open spaces and farmland and agricultural land that we may need to one day be entirely agricultural. But we're talking about permaculture gardens uh, in people's backyards, front yards, in the tree lawns that separate the, does anybody know what a tree lawn is? Yeah. Really? Yeah. All right, good, <laughs> good, no, good, good, good. because I don't have one. Because you don't have, oh, is that why, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I do, I do, I do. So the tree lawn is the, the little strip of grass that separates the, the sidewalk from the curb. And it's a strip of grass, and what does that grass do for you? It looks nice. What else does it do? Not very much. Right? But what if you grew something? And so did the grass in your backyard. And what, what if so did the grass in our city parks? Right? Now, just this week, actually on Monday, we did a ribbon cutting for the first permaculture garden in a public park in Ithaca. It's actually the first one in New York State, in Conley Park. <laughs> Yeah, yes, please, thank you. This is my corner. This is my corner. Now, um, so everybody, so don't worry about it anymore. We're safe. <laughs> no, no. And so it's a, so what is it? It's a small, you, you should check it out. Um, it's labeled, it's labeled all the plants that are in it, the care that they require. So if you're interested as you walk through and you see something that would fit in your home, you can bring it. Why? Because that park alone is not going to save um, this planet. But it can be an example. And if it's successful, we can expand it to other parks in the city. If they're successful, everybody in the city can take what's learned in those parks and grow their own food in their backyards. If we do that, then Ithaca will become an example for other cities in the state. The state will become an example for other states in the country, and this country can be an example for the world. So people always ask me, they look at us like we're crazy in Ithaca. Have you noticed this? <laughs> if I go to Albany or DC, they say, here comes Ithaca with a loony to um, But maybe we, you know, maybe crazy is what it takes. We need to be like that little tiny pocket park. We are not going to, believe it or not, Ithaca is not going to save the world. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know. But our example can. That park is an example for the rest of us. A municipality cannot change these large um, global levers. We can't pull those, but we can, we can set the right pace. Because when things change, whoever's flexible is going to survive, and there's no one more flexible uh, than the little guy or gal. And Ithaca is the little gal, right? So we're going to have to be flexible. Yeah. Hey. Are you going to come to me for a bill on that stormwater tax locally? I, no, I, it's Am a, I going to be taxing it's people a, locally? It's a fee. It's <laughs> so not a tax. It's a fee. Do you need, we do you need you a state? That, no, you don't no, need no, a state no. bill for that? Okay. No. Yes. We spare you. All right. Not an election year, please. No. no. Um, yeah, I get it all the time in Albany. Oh, you're from Ithaca. You know, I say something, you know, very progressive and... Even in the Democratic Conference of the Assembly, you know. There's a lot of this. And, uh, oh, you know, Ithaca. <laughs> and, uh, and I've stopped being defensive about that. I just, said, I just now say, yeah, we're a little bit ahead of most other people. <laughs> we're, we tend to be a little ahead of the curve. Uh, and other people eventually catch up with us. Um, so, and, you know, it's true. We've set so many examples in yes. so many areas uh, for, for state government, drug court, um, the literacy programs, um, many other things. It's actually gotten to be quite a long list. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, we are kind of starting there, too. So um, <clears throat> I kind of took a little different tact on this, but maybe I'll, 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 take, I'll do a little bit of what Savante did, which is to say, what's the role of state government uh, in dealing with this problem? Um, you know, theoretically, state government, New York state government, in any state, is a pretty powerful entity, right? We're a federalist system in the United States with 
a lot of power reserved to the states. Uh, the, the theory was states were powerful. Um, but you all know, um, and, and Gay alluded to, the downward pressures that began to be created, especially uh, with the ascension of Ronald Reagan and government's bad and, and we're gonna, and private initiative is good and we're gonna cut taxes on wealthy people and we're gonna do free trade agreements around the world, NAFTA and GATT and so on, that started a race to the bottom. Uh, we, we cut taxes both at the federal and state level um, on wealthy people, on our wealthiest citizens by about 50% in New York State. Um, and we, uh, we, you know, the right wing has been very successful. Um, Grover Norquist is, I'm sure, toasting champagne every night uh, because government has been shrunk and, um, and made less effective. Um, uh, and, and the government that's left um, is more split than before. It used to be, you know, more often government money, public money was spent on public purposes. You know, it was spent on schools and hospitals and parks and children and so on, health programs. And, and, you know, I haven't seen recent studies on this, but it feels to me like more and more, both at the federal and state level, private interests go and grab more of that. You know, they hate government, but they're, they're there with their hands out um, at every turn. Uh, wanting to take your public tax dollars, your tax dollars that you think you're paying for public benefits, and they're going in private pockets uh, for private purposes and maybe some tangential or secondary public interest. So, so that's operating, of course, out there. I do think there's a, a big push back at this point. I think people are pretty fed up uh, all around the country, and, and we are seeing a new, a new populism coming um, at, at many levels that is... Um, you know, tired, uh, you know, sees the inequality and sees the dangers of that to our democracy and to the issues that we care about. Um, so I'm, I'm not without hope that, <laughs> um, that our governments will respond, even though we see our federal government very choked, pretty paralyzed with um, a very right-wing Congress, uh, and we see our state government not acting uh, fully enough. You know, we as New Yorkers, I think, have always thought we have a really strong progressive state government. And I think we've seen on the fracking battle that, hmm, maybe not so much. Maybe, um, uh, and as I said, you know, taxes were cut. Or we had a go Republican governor for 12 years, right? George Pataki, what does that say about the state of New York, that we had 12 years of a Republican governor who really was instituting a lot of that right-wing thinking? about government, cutting government drastically. Our DEC, for instance, was cut by 800 employees. About a third of the agency or a quarter of the agency was cut under the Pataki years. Uh, he bought up some land in the Adirondacks and made us feel good you know, about that. And Oh, he's an environmentalist. But he did a great deal of damage to the enforcement mechanism uh, for protecting the environment in New York State. Um, and he did all that tax cutting. Uh, and also Mario Cuomo did a bit of it, uh, I think in reaction, trying to save himself really from the right wing tsunami that was happening all over the country. Um, and so they were very successful. They were really brilliant at rolling out this whole thing with, with the plan that Grover Norquist and Ronald Reagan put in place together that George Lakoff talks about in his book, Don't Think of an Elephant. Um, and they set up the think tanks, they set up the Cato Institute and the Heritage Foundation and all the Heartland Institute and all those other propaganda takes, in my view, but a supposed think tanks putting out conservative studies, and then they'd get them all on the airwaves, get them on the media, and then we saw the, the corp, you know, further corporatization of the media and large media and, and all that message going out to everybody. Um, and, and they've been really brilliantly successful. Um, so we have a big battle, as Gay said, on our hands to, to take that back and reown our governments. Um, I'm, I'm not at all without hope. <laughs> I, I get up and you know, work in government every day. I've been doing it for 12 years, and I couldn't do that if I didn't have hope every day. New hope every day. I'm tired at the end of the day. I do run out of hope usually by the end of the day. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but a good night's sleep, I sleep pretty well. Um, um, and I usually wake up with hope anew every day. Um, that, you know, again, be, partly because of, we see, I see so many people mobilized and, and really thinking strategically about how we're gonna take on these challenges. Um, and I've seen, I've been through many battles myself uh, on the voting machine battle, um, especially I'm watching education battles on the budget every year. I see people mobilize and I see them actually make things better and affect what we're doing. And of course the fracking battle, you all know. Uh, we're in year six of holding off the largest, most powerful corporations in the world. 
um, who have a lot of assets here in New York. They're dying, they were dying to get in here, and, and we stopped them. Um, and so you, you, we, we see that we are powerful as people when we mobilize, when we get on a message, when we've done our homework, um, and, we, and we push effectively against government. Now, we haven't won that battle yet, of course. <clears throat> we've got a little hiatus here, and, um, and we're going to have to keep pushing uh, again because they are such powerful forces. Um, but there are other things, you know, that are happening that people can um, link into. It's always, you know, the history is very clear in New York. The, the Democratic-led assembly, the, uh, I'm a Democrat, I'm in the assembly majority. We have always led on environmental issues. We've led on other issues, education and other things, but um, we have always been the leaders in, on environmental issues. We, we do bills over, year after year after year, and finally the Senate will come along and join us um, and, and do bills with us. Uh, and get law. Um, and we're actually one of the greenest states, you know. Um, it's kind of funny to think about because we know how much more we can be doing. But um, both because of all the NYSERDA programs that were put into place years ago and all the energy conservation that a lot of people have done, and because of mass transit in New York City, where something like three to four million people are moved every day on the subway system, uh, makes us a relatively green state. Actually, probably the greenest state in the country. Um, but Again, think of how much we're not doing and how much more we could, we, we could do. Um, so in terms of the things that progressives can do, I mean, there's lots of, there's several very important bills, um, for instance, that people could be supporting. We have a couple of assembly bills. Bob Sweeney is chair of the Assembly uh, Environmental Conservation Committee. You probably all, those of you, um, I think probably most of you on the fracking have gotten familiar with Assemblyman Sweeney. He's from Long Island. Um, and he's got a bill that would, you may remember under Patterson, he put in place what was called Executive Order 24. It was one of the first things Cuomo did. He renewed that executive order um, to um, talk about global warming um, control and um, to talk about the climate action plan and that we were going to start reducing greenhouse gases. Um, but unfortunately, that was just sort of a vague plan. There were never any clear um, benchmarks to get us through that. There was no roadmap. We had, we had nice language, but no real roadmap to get us there. Sweeney's bill, it's Assembly Bill 6327, would actually um, put that, um, the goal of going 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2050, 80, 80 by 50, right? Uh, would put that into statute and would put um, very strong benchmarks every five years reducing the greenhouse gas inventory by, uh, by 10% until we were at 80% reduction. Um, and so that's a great bill to be supporting. Uh, we passed it in the assembly at least twice, maybe more, a couple times anyway. And since 2008, that many years, okay. Uh, time flies when you're having fun. And um, uh, unfortunately, there is not a majority. Um, the GOP controls the Senate. There is no comparable bill. Um, sponsored by a majority member of the Senate. After, again, all these years, um, we haven't gotten the Senate to pick up that bill. But it's probably the most important bill that we could support and try to get through the state legislature. Um, that's a whole other discussion about the Senate and what to do, and I, I'm sure you'll probably get to that's questions. That's one of our questions. Probably get to questions on that. <laughs> another very important bill is another Sweeney bill. Chairs you know, tend to carry these critical bills in any given area. Um, Assembly 6558. Um, says that whenever state money is used for projects, local projects, county, town, so on, you have to consider the risk of climate change. And, uh, and it sets up model zoning laws. Um, so it would require model zoning laws in any, in any in municipal, municipalities that are going to get state money for projects. So we don't want to throw good money after bad, right? Um, and so that's a very, very important bill as well. And there are a bunch of other, there are a bunch of other bills. We're going to put out some information about bills you can support. Now, everyone knows that we've just had the federal, uh, and I know you're going to talk about this, Tony, um, the federal uh, stuff on, on coal um, emissions. Uh, obviously, it's not enough. We're disappointed that, that uh, the benchmarks have been, the, the baseline was changed, and it's, it's not as much as we'd want. It is a step in the right direction, and, you know, people are probably going to want to comment. But when it comes down to the state, when it finally gets done in the federal level, it's gone through the comment period, the final uh, regs are out, it's going to come to the state to implement. Each state is going to implement those, um, 
those reductions. And so that's going to be a very important opportunity starting in June of 2016 um, to weigh in on that state plan because we can make that better. We don't have to live with the federal standards. We can reach for higher standards as we have tended to do historically in New York. And then we become a model for the rest of the country and for the federal government by reaching higher uh, above those federal levels. So that's something that we're going to, uh, that I'm sure we'll be looking at at that time. Um, and many of you did something really important recently, which was to comment on the state energy plan. Um, and that's a really good thing. I think something like 20,000 comments went in. You know, when they see these kind of comments coming in, this makes them sit up and take notice. Um, you know, on the fracking debate, the fracking comments, the first time we commented on the fracking S guys, they got 14,000 comments. You may remember that number. The, the most they'd ever received before on any environmental issue throughout history was 1,000 comments on any environmental issue in the state of New York to the DEC. So 14,000 comments, right? Wow. And then the next time it was 80,000 comments. Wow. And then the next time it was 200,000 comments. So believe me, this is seen as real political pressure. It's a very powerful thing for um, people to do. And then of course, you know, the basics. It's so important for people to vote <laughs> to get to the polls, to get other people to the polls. Our voting numbers are pretty pathetic. We're at 50% voting um, across the state of New York, much less in, an, uh, in mid year elections. Um, this is going against our tradition of getting out. I worry about progressives. I mean, I, I hear from progressives, oh, they're all corrupt, it's all bad, the whole system is. And people say, I'm not going to even vote. It's a corrupted system, I don't want to participate in it. I think that's a terrible. Um, tact for progressives to take. When we walk away, we hand it over to uh, our opponents on these issues. Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to cede the field to the right wing that wants to just keep this race to the bottom going and take over um, the whole, what they do with it then? I don't know. That's, you know they're going to die too, right? I don't quite understand. <laughs> I don't understand their thinking. Um, I don't think they're being rational. But greed is not necessarily irrational. Greed and power don't necessarily reside um, in the same rational uh, spot. Um, so it's really, really important for, vote to, for people to vote. And of course, ultimately, uh, when people are really frustrated and they, and they talk to legislators and they can't get anywhere over and over and over again and they don't seem to be able to educate their legislators, um, you know, what I did uh, years, no, wasn't. People have to get more politically involved. Instead of just working to educate and lobby, people have to run for office, and they have to support other people running for office, and they have to change who's sitting in those seats. And um, progressives need to do more of that, too, and we need to get to candidate schools and encourage people to do that and, and explain to people that the water's fine, come on in, we're having a good time. It's not really, the whole system is not corrupt. There are many, many wonderful, fine people working hard for their communities, and, um, and we should resist the attack on legislatures. Um, and understand that you know, even though a few people might be rotten apples, the majority are not. And, um, and we shouldn't, we sh when we do that, when we attack the legislatures that are, vo that are the voice of the people, we're ceding power to, to, the, more, to the more powerful. Um, so much longer discussion about that, but never without hope. Mm -hmm. So Thank you. Thank you for join in. <laughs> Why everybody was laughing? <laughs> Is it so hard to accept that I might represent the federal government? So, after 37 years of teaching at Cornell University using the Socratic method, you should expect the same tonight, which is that I'm not going to say much to you. Uh, but I'm going to ask of you to answer a bunch of questions, and that's my purpose tonight. I'm supposed to stimulate interaction and discussion in, in the salon motif on the issue of will the federal government intervene to either mitigate uh, or adapt to climate change. But I'm going to start off by asking you some other antecedent questions. Before we get to the will government intervene, we have to ask should the federal government intervene? I'll let you think about that for eight seconds. 
because, for example, I'm stimulating here, there are those who would say that the federal government screws up everything it touches, so why should we think that the federal government should intervene on climate change? I'll stop there for a minute. But if you decide yes to that question, what well, you decide no, the conversation's over. If you decide <laughs> yes to that question, then the next logical question after should the federal government intervene is can the federal government intervene? So, again, to stimulate you, the federal government has a number of agencies, entities, and departments. I'll read you a list. The EPA, the DOE, NOAA, DOD, the Interior, BOM, and NIH. Those are all existing federal government entities that could, if you answer the question, can federal government intervene, could intervene. And again, to stimulate you, I'm going to say my opinion. I'm going to give you a thumb up, a thumb down, or a thumb level, in my opinion, about whether each of those government entities is intervening in a positive sense, that is, doing good, a negative sense, doing bad, or they don't give a damn. <clears throat> DOD. You probably heard that the Pentagon announced that the single most powerful force on Earth, in the galaxy for that matter, <laughs> that could upset our apple cart is not the Iranians or the North Koreans. It's climate change. And the DOD is the single most, it's obviously the largest government department, 400 billion, I think, this year, um, and is doing the most. Billion, towards moving so. towards renewables. How about that? NIH, the National Institute of Health. Where's the moral inter imperative from the federal government? If it's going to be expressed anywhere as a moral imperative, it's through the National Institute of Health. They don't give a damn. These are my opinions. <laughs> DOE. <laughs> and it's lackey the Energy Information Administration. Yeah. NOAA. See, right now we have this, we have a competition in the federal government, of the current administration. We have agencies and entities that are doing this, and agencies and entities are doing that, and then they we say we don't have a climate policy? We don't have an energy policy? No. So NOAA is saying natural gas is really bad. EPA is saying natural gas can be good. Well, which is it? <laughs> BLM, Department of the Interior. Again, to stimulate you, uh, we're going to get to the, the next question in a minute, which is, should the federal government intervene? If yes. Can the government intervene? If yes. Will the government intervene? If yes. What might the BLM do? Let's think of a carbon tax as a form of disincentive. Right? Taxes have many reasons, one of which is to act as a disincentive. Let's increase the leasing cost on federal lands for hydrocarbon development by a factor of 1,000. I'm sorry, that's a carbon tax. It's a disincentive because no company is going to bother with the piddling amount of a few hundred million acres of your land to go get gas or oil out of if it's going to cost them too much. We can talk more about carbon taxes tonight. I hope we can, because a lot of people have different ideas about carbon tax. I have unique ideas about carbon tax, and that's why I should be in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell my wife I said that. <laughs> so if the federal government should intervene, and if through its various existing entities it can intervene, will it? Well, what form might intervention take or has taken? So we just mentioned carbon tax. Energy policy? How many times have we heard it's been seven presidents in a row where we've heard we need an energy policy, we need a national energy policy? Well, we have one now. It's, it's Obama and Putin playing hydrocarbon roulette mm -hmm. with us. Yeah. That's what they're doing. Hydrocarbon roulette. Who's got the biggest natural gas 
reservoir, us or them. And I'm sorry, but that game, when it's over, when that game is over, it's winner take nothing. Yeah, there sure is. So, uh, I, I told you I was just going to ask some questions. Should the federal government intervene? Can the government intervene? Will the government intervene so that we can all start reacting and talking to each other about that? And I've given you some stimulation points. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and I'm really much more interested in what you have to say than anything more I have to say. Am I live? Are you switching me over? Um, because there's a lot of us, we are going with handheld mics tonight, and so we're going to be passing them around. Um, so it would be great if we had a couple of volunteers to serve as um, microphone runners, uh, um, maybe on two sides of the room. And then, of course, if the next person to talking is sitting next to you, just hand them the microphone. Um, the first question I wanted to post to the group is, okay, we, we understand that it's stuck in many ways, but can we identify points of leverage where we could make things go faster? Um, Barbara mentioned when tens of thousands of us comment on things, it at least slows them down if they're about to do something bad. <laughs> but what other, what other ideas do we have or where can we get some traction uh, in terms of helping our governments take some of the best practices steps appropriate to their level um, that, that could help us cope? And I wanted to uh, see if any of you wanted to respond to that first before we go out, um, or you could just chime in later. I would take a shot at it just to, to echo uh, Assemblywoman Lefton's point which is that voting, it, you want to have leverage points of government. Um, elected officials want to keep their jobs, right? That's a leverage point. And uh, if, you, if we vote them out, and I hear this way too often, particularly from people whose values are otherwise in the right place, young people. I hear from young people that government's too corrupt and, and they don't want to participate so they're not going to vote. That's like saying that the air is too dirty, I don't want to plant any trees. The only way to fix it, the only way to fix it, is to vote and to get involved. So I think uh, if we can increase voter turnout in this country, first make it easier to register to vote, make it easier to vote itself. Right? I can buy a house on my, I can't buy a house, government salary, but somebody <laughs> could buy, a, one could buy a house, <laughs> one could buy a million dollar house, sight unseen, online, pay a million dollars but we can't find a way for people to vote from their smartphones or from their laptops. Of course we could, right? But one side doesn't want us to. Because if the majority of people in this country vote, if 90% of the people in this country voted, we would have an extremely different country. Mm -hmm. right? I think that's, that's a leverage point we should, we should take advantage of. Okay, Greg and then Alan. This one here. And, and any, uh, raise your hands up high so that I can see them when you do okay. So this is responding. Oh, I can't. Uh, this is responding to one of your points, Mayor Myrick. Uh, you were talking about the um, the getting the, the getting the local business to be um, more prevalent. And one of the points that I think is is critical is for us to start measuring local commerce and not just cross border commerce. Um, there's a lot of metrics that are based on how much goes out and how much comes in instead of how much stays here. Yeah. If, if I may just jump in a quick on that point, it's such a good point and, it, 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 and I think if we knew the facts, it would change the way we prioritize local business. Because one fact we do know, just from a downtown at the Alliance survey that's now a few years old, um, I think six years old, is that people who live downtown spend seven times as much money as people who work downtown. Mm -hmm. And people who work downtown spend twice as much money per year as tourists. Right? So because if you live downtown, it's not just that you buy a trinket, but it's not just that you buy coffee. You buy every meal, you buy groceries, you buy all your clothes. 
where you live. So uh, we certainly know that there's a multiplier effect to chop a So just to comment on this question of the importance of voting, uh, I believe that it's important to vote, but as you said, uh, politicians want to keep their jobs, and the higher up you go in government, the more keeping your job means you're accountable to the millionaires and the billionaires that are funding your campaigns. So I think we need to think that we have to vote, but we also have to be having mass movements, uh, social movements uh, online, in the streets, um, in front of buildings, so that politicians really understand that they have to be accountable to the people because it's visible right in their face, and the corporations see that as well. So the combination of social movements and voting is what I think is what we need. If we just do voting, I think people don't have the confidence for good reasons. Um, and uh, and then to, you could just hand it to Sue when you're done. All right. Um, I, have, I have two questions. I have a question for uh, you, Mayor. Um, what are the barriers to having uh, hydroelectric in Ithaca? Um, as I understand it, just the cost. Just the cost. We have the two things you need. So the question was, what are the barriers to having hydroelectric in Ithaca? You really, you need two things. You need water and you need cliffs. <laughs> we've got those two. I mean, we've got both of those. You need gravity, right? And, and you have that. Um, my understanding is that the hydroelectric uh, generators we had went out because they weren't cost competitive. And then when the city had an opportunity to include as part of its water plant, a hydroelectric plant, it opted not to. And again, as I heard though, this was many years before me. Not before my term, I mean before me. Uh, <laughs> um, um, they, they chose not to. Why do you have more info? Yeah. Totally agree. It's, it's more than just money. It's either the dam of work or you have to divert the waterfall. Right. Mm -hmm. So those will put, take away natural and tourist sure. attractions. So we already have several dammed gorges which feed into a water plant, a 3 6 mile creek. So we have three dams in a row. Okay, and then not trying to hog the mic, but um, this is for you, Barbara. On the state level, uh, yes, there's been a problem of this Republican juggernaut, but I think that part of that is that they have been successful in framing the debate as a moral question, and the Democrats have kind of ceded that ground. Um, when the answer to climate change and pollution is uh, increasing regulation, then that um, it continues to cede that ground. When you're making positive steps, such as building hydroelectric or um, infrastructure that helps people in case of a flood um, <coughs> or uh, you know, emergency services, um, then you get to the opportunity to reframe the debate so that the moral higher ground is actually with the people. I mean, do you see evidence of that happening on a state level? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, what, what does government do except to try to pass laws that affect behavior, whether it's individual behavior or communal behavior, business behavior. Um, and I, I don't know, are you, are you sort of implying that we shouldn't regulate business or big polluters? I mean, no, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not quite clear on the... Light a single candle kind of angle. I mean, if you're going to go all the way left, I'd say, why isn't the state owning the power plant? You know, why, why, why are uh, utilities uh, private companies? Why aren't we, don't, why aren't, so why haven't we socialized, why haven't we nationalized so or socialized business? I mean, basically, you know, I, I think that there's a need to reframe the debate so that the people on the left or the people who are progressive or liberal are explaining it in terms of a moral higher ground. I mean, you use the word greed which is very useful and very applicable. Um, and I think that, but I think that what happens is when the focus is on regulation of business and people are hurting for jobs, then you are ceding that ground. 
Well, I was really <laughs> led to a short answer. No, I'm going to I'm going to have to mull the question. I guess um, you know. Our, our, our environmental law in our country and state are based on the notion of private property, you know? That I own property and what you do over here can hurt my property, you know? And we got our Clean Air Indoor Air Act because of the same notion. You can't blow smoke in my face, you know? We're gonna stop letting people smoke in public buildings and so on and call it what you want. That is, you know, passing a law, passing a mandate, passing a regulation. And you know we can frame it in terms of protecting people's health, um, protecting <laughs> protecting life on the planet, <laughs> um, protecting future generations, and and certainly I do that, and I think many of my colleagues do that. Um, and you know I don't think we really use the word regulation a lot when we are, when we're debating these issues, but we talk about the need to bring down pollution, the need to go green, uh, and the need to protect future generations from what we see as a an impending, you know, an ever increasing uh, threat. So, I think you're. I don't right know if I'm answering. I'm not sure that, that I'm fully getting the, the question. Uh, right wing framing seems to hold obviously great appeal because yeah. of, like, our state senate is captured by mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. set of interests. But it is very moral to talk about preventing harm to future generations and to prevent. Mm -hmm the public at large from having to pay for all the externalities generated when profits are being internalized and costs are being externalized. It's, it's a moral <laughs> argument to step in and intervene and stop that uh, through regulation. And then there have been efforts to positively incentivize um, through tax credits, et cetera, you know, the adoption of good behavior like investing in renewables. But let's go to Sue and then you had several hands up yeah. back here. Um, which one was uh, there? And then the, the, that man will be third. Okay. Maybe people could name them. Could they? Yeah. Could you themselves? say who you are when you uh, speak? That'd be great. That'd be great. Hi, I'm Sue Cosentini. And when we talk about leverage points for um, holding government accountable, I don't know how you can avoid reforming campaign finance. I mean, it, it's always occurred to me that we all in the progressive. Um, you know, arena are so disparate. We, there's so many, and that one single thing would make a huge impact because they're having, the, they're writing our legislation, and, and the politicians are the ones that dictate how the commons are really um, managed. And then the other no, one that's not the commons, commons. <laughs> <laughs> you got that. We know, we know Gary, Gary does that. Gary Ferguson does that. And what the hell about that, anyways? <laughs> what do you mean? Why don't you get some contractors what do you that mean? can? <laughs> <laughs> um, Something bad all the time. <laughs> then the other thing that the other thing that occurs to me is, of course, the fairness doctrine. Like our media has no incumbency to actually report anything that 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 talks about what government is doing and what the um, businesses are doing. They can just just print and promulgate purient crap, and we succumb to it, subscribe to this stuff that we're fed that's just a bunch of pablum and worse. Instead of actually having, because the fairness doctrine is gone, or whatever that thing it was called that used to be around, and at six o'clock you sat down and there was actually something reported that actually told you something about the world that you live in and, and what the politicians are doing about the world that you live in, and that's completely gone. And there's been, what, in the last, um, 11 years, over 11 new, um, whatever those things are called, those celebrity weekly things, those celebrity magazines, those, those ridiculous People things. Magazine. And they, they, those media outlets just found out where they're, um, you know, bread it's buttered on. And it's those crappy uh, pieces of whatever you want to call them, instead of actually reporting news. And, and they had to be required to do that, and they don't anymore. Those two things, it seems to me, are the things that we should galvanize ourselves with. Mm -hmm. Good point. And then back to Janine. Uh, yeah, I really want to thank Dr. Ngrafia for bringing up the carbon tax. That's really important. <coughs> because what a carbon tax does is it taxes at the point of um, extraction, um, I forget, importation, extraction. It hits it right from the start and puts a real realistic price on fossil fuels, which also gives renewables a chance to compete. Um, they are always talking about cap and trade, and cap and trade is really well, it's permits to pollute. You know, you can trade. You know, you can trade um, trade it back and forth. 
keep under a certain cap, big deal, the cap wouldn't be high enough anyway, uh, or low enough, I should say. Um, it's, a, it's sort of like a Wall Street boondoggle, a miasma. I can't think of the word I really want to say, but it's a real boondoggle. So it would be a threat to efforts to prevent climate change because it just takes forever to get things settled, to get, to get through all the miasma. A carbon tax is really the way to go. It's really important. And the city of Ithaca and the town of Ithaca and the county of Tompkins have all passed resolutions in support of a carbon tax. I worked with Sylvester Johnson and Margaret McCasland on getting that through. Um, when, anyway, so I really wanted to reemphasize that whole point about the carbon tax. Cap and trade is just a, it's just a miasma that's only going to mess things up. And in fact, um, Dr. James Hansen said of, was right, right out loud when he was uh, in California, said that California's cap and trade. Um, proposal was half-baked and half-assed. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. anyway, carbon tax. That's right. And just so he wants nuclear. He wants nuclear, so. Hanson is, Hanson is, <laughs> My name's Paul Moore, and I'm uh, a native of Ithaca, and I presently live in the town. And uh, you're right about Noah. I've worked for them for seven years, and they're very good you, people. Can you talk to Sure. Is this better? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, there's a lot of different things I'd love to say, but it seems like the um, level of discussion has to change from right and left to go up a level to we're all citizens of the planet. And if it doesn't survive, we don't survive. So the water, the air, the sun, you know, everything. So how to do that? It seems like a good accounting tool to do that is to require businesses to use full cost accounting and to include the cost of energy in their development, in their production, and in the destruction of their products as a mechanism to have them, um, they'd automatically man manifest a carbon tax because they'd actually reduce their process if they were being, having to pay for it and show that. But there's a lot of other like different perspectives that you could think about. Suppose that instead of living in a market-driven voting world, it was required as a citizen to vote. I mean, literally required. Then the whole, the whole idea of trying to get 31% of the population, half of that, to get someone to vote um, would disappear. But all of those are going to be irrelevant, actually, unless the values of the people and the corporations that are involved change. So what's the mechanism to do that? I mean, if every citizen and every corporation had to take the um, level of a B corporation's ethics, or to basically sign the Hippocratic Oath, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that was a requirement for them to do business, then Subway would not be able, would not be permitted to have um, cups, tops that are not disposable, whereas Walmart does have them that are disposable. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's crazy. So, I mean, there's a lot of pieces you could argue, but it's like the discussion has to go to a, a much higher level. And once people have the same value in their heart rather than just in their mind, mm -hmm. then everybody can go in their own direction because they're all aiming the same place. It just mm -hmm. looks like it's different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good points. Um, um, over here. And then were there, and then there, okay, I gotta stand up to keep an eye on all these hands. I can't quite see them all. So we will go uh, Sarah, and Dan, and Ed, and other Sarah. So here first. Oh, or, and then you too. Okay. Mm. Mm. Oh. I'm Sarah. Yeah. I don't know if this is working. Oh, is this working? Um, oh, it's on. It's on. OK. So I thought maybe Miranda would say something on the topic of carbon tax, because she wears another hat. Um, there's a group that's uh, a chapter that started up in Ithaca of a national, probably even international group called Citizens Climate Lobby, which is lobbying just for that sort of tax. And maybe you could talk to Miranda afterward if you're interested, because there's a meeting happening this weekend, a monthly meeting. And also, if you look at their website, there's also been, there's also um, a very good resource called the Carbon Tax Institute, which has a lot of information, Center. Center, sorry, um, online uh, about um, economists from different ends of the ideological spectrum supporting a carbon tax. So it's not, it's an idea that I think is gaining some traction, and I think um, if we can, you know, try to move it along through 
letters to the editor, comments on things written you know, in newspapers. Um, I think that's a good way of also, as you say, you know, showing citizen interest in such a thing. And as far as you know, where are the points where we can press people? I think about. I mean, in some ways, I think we're very fortunate here in Ithaca. We're in sort of a bubble, and we have all this you know progressive energy. Um, my sister lives in Southern California, where there doesn't seem to be much progressive. I mean, it's probably there, but it's pretty well hidden from anything I've seen. And so I'm trying to think of, you know, what sort of campaigns appeal to people who don't have this mindset already, because that's really, I think, where the education needs to be. Um, and then I think about the, you know, the anti-smoking campaigns and how, um, you know, all the different, um, you know, resources that were brought to bear to, to, great, to drastically reduce the smoking rate in this country. Um, there were warnings on cigarette packages, you know, advertise, certain kinds of advertising were, were banned. So I think what Tony was talking about, the National Institutes of Health, I think that we really need to mobilize um, our health community, um, both locally, which I think we've done statewide, which we've done, and, and especially on a national level, to, um, to make it really hit more closer to people's homes and where they live. Because, you know, my parents' generation, um, you know, smoking was considered normal behavior. And now it's like, you know, people are huddled outside, you know, far from buildings in the dead of winter. You know, I mean, it's considered sort of shameful. So, I mean, I think shame is a really good motivating factor. And I'm just trying to brainstorm right now, but it seems like maybe that would be a way to change people's thinking in a better direction. So we'll go Bob and then John, and then we'll go back over here to Don. <laughs> Ed, Sarah Hess, Linda, Linda. and then we're, we need to move on to the next one. So let's keep them keep them fast. Yeah, I'm Bob Duckett, and Paul sort of stole my fire a little bit <clears throat> about the uh, uh, the desire to point fingers and take sides. Is I do not believe it is productive. Make no mistake, the right wing can love their families just as much as anybody else, and also love the environment. You know, uh, Ducks Unlimited is a good example uh, of, a, of an organization that tends to be at right-leaning that does a lot for the environment. So, you know, we don't want to alienate those on the other side of our thought process. This, the green energy movement will stand on its own merit. Don't, don't ever think it won't, because it will. It can't lose if you just stay right with it. Hi, my name's John Graves, and uh, the one regulatory leverage point that I've seen for years and couldn't figure out why it's not used better is the State Environmental Quality Review, Seeker, which every development project has to have. So my question is, why can't we use that? The state of buildings have to use it. The, Ithaca, the city of Ithaca uh, water treatment plant had to use it because the local <clears throat> action plan asked them to use it. Uh, uh, O'Brien and Gear engineering firm did the, uh, the environmental on carbon. I mean, they figured out if you go to uh, the, the uh, Bolton Point, you're going to have this amount of carbon. If you go to uh, where the water is coming from, you'll have this amount of carbon, and you could use a hydropower. So I don't know why we don't use that. <laughs> David wants to answer the question. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just point out that in 2012, the DC actually revised the uh, short and long forms for environmental review to include for the first time, some questions related to climate change and the smart growth policies that, that the mayor was talking about, but most municipalities are just starting to figure out how to use those, what to do with them, and it will require, I think, you know, or let's put it this way, the more the citizens get interested and involved in project reviews and try and make those questions meaningful in terms of review, the more likely they'll have impact. Back there to Don, does he have the, uh, Don? All right, then Ed, then Don, and uh, Whatever. Sarah Hess. Um, th these are not really, um, 
these are just ideas. And um, I've been doing some work for uh, Barbara Robertson's campaign. Uh, yeah, Martha Robertson's campaign. Hi, Barbara. Um, the, uh, and doing a lot of phone calling out outside of Tompkins County. And Tuesday, I was spent about three hours calling people outside of Tompkins County, trying to measure what kind of support we might find for Martha out there. And uh, this is just as, a, as an example. And when you're calling in the afternoon, a lot of people are at work. But if they're home, you get some uh, ideas. Uh, this was a couple who were registered as independents by our sheets that we have. And th the wife answered the phone, and I asked about, wanted to talk to you guys about how, how you're leaning to vote this election and what issues you have. Um, and she said, well, I'm going to let my husband answer that. And he came on the, he came on the line, and I said, so, well, and, it's, and, and, and you have to question how independent they are. But um, <laughs> um, so I asked, I asked quickly, um, what issues are, you know, f foremost on your mind? And he hadn't really been thinking about it, but he said, uh, we need to do something about the veterans. And I said, so who are you leaning for towards in terms of voting? He said, oh, well, I, I almost always vote Republican. And I said, so you'd be voting for Tom Reed then in this election? He said, yes. And I said, and I immediately said, and of course, you know, Tom Reed voted for the Ryan budget and he was going to cut veterans benefits. The Ryan budget cuts veterans benefits. He said, and his immediate reaction was, you people just try to twist everything. <laughs> um, so, so that's sort of a lead in to people being in a certain mindset about their politics, right? The second thing that I've been thinking about as we've been talking here is I've watched the new Cosmos series. If, if people have uh, been watching that at all, uh, and, and most of it, and most of it is stuff that we, if you've read and paid attention, you know already. But what's What's fascinating to me is that it ran on the Fox channel. And I'd really like to see what, what the viewership um, is on that program because, because they're explaining away a lot of the arguments of the right. Um, that, and, and we talk about changing voter attitudes and maybe getting people excited enough to get out and vote about things. I think. That's, uh, the media is one big thing that can really help. Thank you, Ed. And back, back to Don. <laughs> and we're going to, and after this, after, after the three that have been, we're going to move to the next question. Hi, I'm Don Barber. And uh, the question is, who will protect the interests of the people? And actually, it can only be the people. We talked earlier about voting. Um, I will suggest there's another way that you can protect your interest, and that is through your purchasing decisions, your actions that you take every day, including on your way home tonight. Um, that's how we're going to protect the interests of the people, by carrying out through our actions what we believe in our mind to be true and what we see happening <coughs> around us. And then where are the leverage points? Um, we've talked quite a bit about uh, public, lack of public money, private money, uh, buying a plutocracy that's running our federal government federal government and currently working on the state government as well. The only government left to advocate for the civil society is local government. And uh, the mayor talked about the neat things that are happening in Ithaca and many other towns around. So we are um, having an effect locally, and you can. And I believe that's where you're going to have the most leverage at this point in time. Uh, we, can, we can lead. And we can lead by our personal actions, by collectively working through our local government. Thanks, Don. And, uh, and I think it goes to Sarah, and then here, and then we're going to go to the next question. Hi, uh, Sarah Hess. I have a question, actually, for Tony. Um, I'm really intrigued by the idea that you presented, which is that of all the federal government's uh, departments that could make an influence, the one, the only one, is the Department of Defense. And I really haven't thought of trying to make allies with the military-industrial complex <laughs> until 
you said that, and then I thought, how do I do that? Mm -hmm. You know, what, you, at your level, uh, how can we use the advantages of the research that they are investing in, that the ideas that they're coming up, they're reframing foreign policy in terms of uh, protecting natural resources instead of causing water shortages and destroying minerals and governments wherever we go. Uh, how can we support the good things that they might be doing and take advantage of that in the work that we do? I'm still on, right? Yeah. Um, so I have engaged with people in the Department of Defense. I have invited representatives of agencies within the Department of Defense whose job it is to promote drastic increase in the use of renewables. All military bases in the United States now have a renewable portfolio standard that makes the most progressive state in the, war, in the country look poor. We're supposed to be, the, the major military bases in the US are supposed to be renewable energy completely within 20 years. So well, it's easy I, when you have all our taxpayer yeah, dollars. Yeah, with, to with, buy our, it. with our dollars. <laughs> Uh, and they're doing that for, for reliability and stability in, in having energy on those bases all the time uh, and avoiding the, what's obviously happening, drastically in, drastic increases in energy costs if they keep going fossil fuels. So I use those examples when I get people in New York State pushing back and saying, you can't get solar in New York State, you can't get wind in New York State, you know, it, it's only in Arizona and California where it works. Uh, and so I point out and I give them information and data that, well, look, the Department of Defense is doing it on every base, including the ones in Alaska. So there's an example of the federal government, an agency of the federal government you would least expect to be leading the way, leading the way. Yeah. And, and by the way, the right usually admires and protects the Department of Defense. <laughs> uh, and of course, the Department of Defense would never do anything as progressive and liberal as using renewable energy? Really? <laughs> so it stops them in their tracks. Actually, it reminds me that they took the lead in desegregation yeah, in America, exactly. um, very dramatically and uniquely at the time. So um, I'm Linda Levine, um, and I'm just, there's a couple of times people have mentioned this idea of claiming the moral high ground, reframing the question, and then Robert uh, mentioned um, you know, Ducks Unlimited. And I think those are all really important issues that I think about this on the Dryden Town board where I sit, because you know, we know these people really intimately face to face, and so they, even the opposition, are kind of our friends. Um, and, and it's clear that we have mutual interests. My interest in the trail system for the county and for Dryden you know, is the same as some of the very most conservative anti-tax people who come to the meetings normally. So I think we found that in the fracking debate, that people like Ducks Unlimited, I think, you know, helped support that, uh, our side, because um, they cared about the environment and um, ducks and <laughs> hunting. And that's OK. you know. Um, so I, I think it's really important that we realize that politics makes strange bedfellows, like the DOD, and, um, and that there is a higher moral imperative here that we ought to figure out how to frame um, and not push away people that don't share a whole lot of our other social you know, inclinations. And that brings us to this very next question that mm -hmm. I raised earlier that it has felt especially to, to older people, baby boomers and on, that um, it seemed like our government in the past had more successes at protect, protecting the public good. You know, back in the, the 60s, the civil rights movement, all that legislation, the early environmental legislation, that we were able to do things, get things done um, on behalf of the common good. And it has felt like especially from the 80s on, you know, the Reagan-Thatcher era, that it's been about shrinking government, government is bad, um, and, and so that's what we're all supposed to embrace. And this, uh, it feels to me like what I've heard all my life is this framing where freedom is about the individual, and it kind of stops there. It doesn't there isn't, uh, reciprocity isn't part of the conversation and anything about the collective. 
Um, and it's also interesting to me that we don't understand that our individual rights are held in a container called the public good. Uh, and, and so we, and then of course, I believe it's been manipulated so that the conversation about freedom and individual rights makes people think that they're voting in their own interests around something that's core, but then when the reality turns out that all the money is being funneled up and the gap between the rich and the poor is growing, and you know the outcome is different than the promise, uh, um, that the, ide the ideological frame. So I feel like this is a, such an important piece to wrap our heads around because it does get to this values issue that we all have friends and family and neighbors that we have a lot of overlap with. And sometimes if we could get into a conversation, we might discover just how much that overlap is there. But like your responded on the phone, the, the filters and the barriers go up so quickly anymore. And it's almost like a tribal response of, oh, you're that other tribe, so I can't even hear anything you say. So let's dig into that a little bit about how do we go about dealing with that. We have green shirt in the back, then here, then Anna, Sasha. Uh, he hasn't spoken before, so. And Tony, and Tony, um, let's have our respondents. Later. Oh, you'll just jump in later? Okay. Hi. <clears throat> uh, I'm Scott Brim. A lot of people have been talking about how to change beliefs. Uh, typically by using facts. Ed isn't here, but you know, Ed experienced it directly. I was reminded the other day that if you have a belief, a principle, that is enmeshed in something that's bigger, a bigger belief, a bigger principle, there's no way you can attack it directly. It's impossible. It, it is absolutely armored. Attacking it makes it stronger, or rather makes it more dogmatic. So you know, people are saying all we have to do is convince them of this thing. That, that's completely the wrong tactic. You need to look at what it is that it's enmeshed with. And, and people, there are different groups, right? It, you know, it could be religion, could be anything, could be fear of losing freedom. Um, look at what they're enmeshed with and try to deconstruct that. You know, say, why is this important to you? A and get in there like that. So in other words, don't just wail on it directly. That's not going to work, right? right. Okay. That's a curiosity. Hi, thanks. I'm Anna Kellis. And um, I was thinking about what, what works in politics as far as a message and ideology, um, what keeps the divide. And one of the things that I was thinking um, that is very human nature um, and is something that the media in the United States and the culture in the United States really draws on, which is the fear of scarcity. Um, and I think about the Republican message, which is so, so simple, which is, we will leave more money in your pockets. And um, that's, that's what they say. I mean, I, we all know that that's not what really happens, but, but it is the greatest marketing message. If you know, we are putting millions and millions of dollars, if our companies are putting millions of dollars to tell people, you're unhappy because you don't have enough, we're always scarce, and then the government adds on to that and says, oh, well, we're gonna give you more money. We're gonna leave more money in your pockets. So I think about why it's so difficult for um, our movement in the environmental movement and a more uh, progressive movement, our message is much more complicated. So um, in answering your question, I think how do we break down that divide in these ideological differences? Um, and I feel like on some level we need to address the fear, the human fear under it all, which is how do we express that it won't lead to scarcity? Um, and that might be a great place to start is understanding the fear nature that we're all dealing with, so. Mm -hmm. Very good, and I believe you were next. Yeah, um, a couple of thoughts. Um, I wanna go back and then come to this point, but I have to go back to this thing about we ought to vote, you know. <coughs> There were a number of polls about 25 years ago. Um, re people really looked at the people that weren't voting, and two-thirds of the people that weren't voting were poor and working-class people. 
And they were mainly not voting, not because they were lazy or they were not fulfilling their responsibility. They didn't see anyone that spoke to them and their interests. And the Democrats, and I don't include you as part of that, you're wonderful, Barbara, but the Democratic Party, come on. They have been equally guilty at following corporate interests and denying the interests of working class people in this country. And by that I mean 70%, 65, 70% of the population and doing the bidding of corporations. And some of the worst damage has been done by people like Bill Clinton. Well, the, the point was that Democrats have done you know, enormous damage uh, to working class people. And, and Thomas Frank in his book, what happened to Can you know, whatever happened to Kansas, I mean, it was very, very smart and very right in the sense that it ceded all of that really important economic territory by basically offering very similar things. And the right said, okay, let's get working people on God, guns, and gays. Because the Democrats aren't talking union rights, civil rights, they're not talking any of those issues anymore. So I think we really have to take a hard look at the Democratic Party and just saying vote, I mean, so we all go out and vote for Mario Cuomo? I'm sorry, that man is doing enormous Andrew. damage in this. Oh, sorry, Andrew. <laughs> yes, he did. He did start the tax cuts and, and so, you know, I, I think we need to be involved politically. We need to get off our butts and we need to get organized. And some of you may know I spent about 10 years of my life trying to help organize a labor party in this country. And I'm very sorry that we failed because I think we need it desperately right now. Working people need a political vehicle that speaks to their interests. And I think we need to reframe that discussion, corporations versus the rights of the vast majority of us who are working people, who have to work for someone else to earn a living, which is a very a much um, more realistic way of understanding how our rights as individuals are very restricted as working people because we don't have all those choices. And I think we, I'm moving to the next question about how do you reframe this. A lot of my students, they hear me talking theoretically about the possibility of government doing good things. And one very smart student said to me at the end of my course, he said, Professor Bowney, you, you're always talking about these positive things that government can do, but I, I don't understand where that optimism comes from. I don't see that. And these kids, this generation, they have grown up in a world where the government has done very little for them. Uh, and it has been either dysfunctional or doing bad things. And so uh, it, it really is a problem. It's a problem of an entire generation. That's why a lot of them are moving towards libertarianism or anarchism because they can't imagine good government anymore. And, and it's something we have to really work on. But the, I guess the, the main point I was trying to make here is that they like the other side that likes to talk about individual rights, likes to make us think that if we just allow the market to do its work, we have all this individual freedom. I mean, it comes right out of Hayek and Milton Friedman and those guys. Market is all about individual freedom. Government is about tyranny. That's the way they frame it. We have to get people to understand that we don't live in a world where anybody can start a business and do their thing. We live in a world that is incredibly dominated by these corporate goliathons that are enormous and, and d dominate two-thirds of the economic activity in this world. And so that little piece of freedom that we would all like is, is very constricted. And we need to get them to understand that. And when my students understand that, you know, over 50 of the top 100 economic entities in the world, including all the countries, are multinational corporations, that be, we have to get them to understand that if we take government away and we let those markets rip, it is those massive institutions that we are going to be totally dependent on, and that's what they want on every level. So, uh, Tony, can, can I, can I, thank you. Can um, I, and uh, I, I think our panelists are ready to respond. Uh, Start with Tony. Tony is ready to uh, go next. <laughs> 
I'm going to make uh, an attempt to refocus us on question two because I, I, I really enjoyed hearing all the comments, but not many of them have focused on that question. So I'm going to ask you a question. What does Dryden in Middlefield and the New York State de facto moratorium on shale gas development have to do with the battle between individual rights and the public good? Everything. Let me explain. Why is it that the oil and gas industry is exempt from all federal environmental regulations? Why is it that the, except for one state in the United States, we hope, all other states, oil and gas law trumps zoning? Why is that? Okay. Individual rights to own minerals. Individual rights to own minerals. The United States is almost alone in, in the galaxy allowing people to own their mineral rights from here to China. And so the argument from the oil and gas industry has always been the reason why we are exempt from federal regulation and the reason why we can trump zoning law is because the individual right to develop his or her mineral rights trumps the public good. That's the problem we have right now. It's exactly the problem we have right now, which is causing the exacerbation of climate change because we're increasing the production of fossil fuels by allowing individual mineral ownership rights to trump the public good. Argue with me. <laughs> that wasn't the argument that they made in the case. No, the I know, but that was the point. That was that, exactly the point. The Everybody point. who talks about that case got it wrong from two perspectives. Number one, the only reason the oil and gas industry is pursuing that case is not because there's shale gas under Dryden. There ain't any. There will never be a shale gas well in the town of Dryden. Never. They're only doing it because it's precedent setting because it would say for the first time, a group of individuals in a small town in upstate New York said public good trumps individual mineral rights. And that is unacceptable to the oil and gas industry. And we it's acceptable to the renewables that, industry, by the way. That was not the legal argument. It was not the legal argument. Excuse me, yeah, not, I didn't say that was the legal argument. I said that's the they, heart of the case. It's why they pursued it. It's why but they pursued we it. We did make that argument at the local level. That sure. was exactly the exactly. argument that, it was, that we made. We talked about um, our air. We talked about our, our desire to live in this kind of community where we were a community. We talked about... Um, and essentially you told, water? essentially, I'm using the word greed because you used yeah. it first. I'm not allowed to use the word greed in public. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm greed. I'm serious. I've given over 150 talks in New York and Pennsylvania and around the world. And our county of Ithaca is the only place where I have been told explicitly I'm not allowed to use the word greed when I talk. But you used it first, so I'm going to use it tonight. <laughs> So the okay, issue, the issue okay. is you had individuals, you had individuals in Dryden who owned mineral rights and had leased their land and they wanted to make money. And I'm sorry, right. yeah. compared to the public good, that's yeah. a greedy position. And we told them exactly yeah. that, you know, that their individual right to make money was not the primary Bingo. right you know, that the public good trumped that right, and that's why it passed. So now the question is, how do we address that problem on a larger scale than Dryden? Well, if the case wins, then there are a lot of yeah. towns which will be able to, <laughs> have, to express the dam, that. The dam is broken. But we, and should, we should make it more deliberately a case around that idea and make it a public, a public, you know, um, a public idea, conversation a conversation, that. and yeah. in the papers, and you know that this is actually what's being accomplished yeah. by winning this. Winning so there is a connection case. between climate change, yeah. fossil fuel development, mineral <laughs> rights, and the right of the people is good to trump individual mineral rights, right. and that's the issue we're addressing. Right, right. and, and we're I, still doing I, it. 
if I could zoom up a bit, zoom out, and get to this question of how can we address the ideology who tells us that we, we should not, that there is no public good. And it really is a cynicism. And it did start with Reagan, or it didn't start with Reagan, but Reagan was the best. Emphasized it. He was the Mes best deliverer messenger. of this message. Start with Gore. Which was that the government was bad, it could do no good for you. Oops. So uh, you should abandon all government solutions and look to yourself. The way we can combat that message, the best way to combat any message, is to tell the, the right story. Because right? we know that the lessons that come from stories, what do you call a lesson that you learn from a story? A moral. A moral. <laughs> see, how, see that? A moral. And if we tell the right story, we get the right moral. So when your students come to you and say, why are you hopeful about government? And you say, yeah, government hasn't done anything in your life. Right away, you've told them the wrong story. Right away, you should say, how did you get here today, to class today? Did you walk on a sidewalk built by government? Did you drive on the road built by government? How did you know that you weren't going to be um, overtaken by a band of marauders because of the police department, which is run by the government? Right? The lights were on, which is the government. We prevented all sorts of traffic accidents. A thousand small things are accomplished every day that allow individuals to live lives of purpose, satisfaction, and fulfillment because we've banded together and invested in the public common good. Right. And if we can talk again and again about how possible that is, point to something as simple and as basic as a road and say, that's a public good. Do public goods seem bad to you? People say, no, well, that's not bad. This is a sidewalk. Does a sidewalk seem bad to you? The sidewalks are kind of nice. A public park. <laughs> People say, I love my public park. A school teacher. Clean right? drinking water. <laughs> right, clean drinking water. You want to talk about potholes? Pot, I do want to talk about <laughs> I do want to talk about, all the time I want to talk about potholes. But if we can remind people that that is government, that is collective action, right? A fire department is a socialist agent. <laughs> if we, so is an insurance company, right? If we can remind people of that, you can break the stigma that says government bad, private good. And people will, if you tell that story again and again, and show them all the things in their lives. Um, we're the government facility right now. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Thank you. Listen, uh, if we look at the time, it's 10 of. And. Um, we have another question, and we wanted to save just a couple of minutes for any announcements at the end. And things are really bubbling right now in the room. There's lots of hands up. I don't quite know what to do about that. Um, Let it go on. So are you willing to spend a few minutes with this last question, or would you prefer to keep, up, keep on this one? Go to three? Yes. All right, so the question is, um, in terms of uh, the government's ability to intervene in the marketplace, um, what would be some ways that we could make it more fair? And uh, if we could have hands that go up so I can put you in some order. Miranda? Maybe some yes. people haven't spoken? And if, if, of people especially who haven't spoken before. And I'll go very fast. I'm not usually fast, but I don't know. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I just at the local level, there's some very quick things. Stormwater is, is a good example of this. If you can internalize this to private property owners, so however much stormwater you generate is what you have to pay for instead of having the whole community uh, pay for it. That, this was actually, I should mention while um, Ms. Levine is here, that her son uh, was the chair of the task force that came up with this idea, R. N. Levine, the city attorney. He also came up with the idea that we're now instituting for sidewalks, which does the same thing. The larger property you own, and the more valuable that property is, say if you're a large Walmart or a large apartment building, the more you pay for sidewalks. Why? Because it's a public good that you, better gener that you benefit more from than the smaller uh, landlords. Now here's a one thing that's coming, and I want everybody to have a heads up, but it's, it's, it's the same principle, but it's going to be far less popular than those two things. Um, parking. What? Parking. We subsidize parking. Uh, to the tune of about a million dollars a year in the city of Michigan. A million dollars a year. That means in, in our parking garages lose that much each year. Uh, what does that mean? It means that taxpayers, property taxpayers, anybody who owns a home in the city is making it cheaper to own a car mm -hmm. for the people who drive it. Right? So you can internalize that by pushing that cost on the user, it's like a carbon tax would, uh, by rationalizing 
the cost of parking. Did I say, okay, now let me, okay, so here's the punchline. The cost of parking will likely go up. Right, that's the punchline. In most, in most places. The places where it's most valuable to park will become more expensive. And the places where it's um, less valuable to park will become less expensive. The people who can't afford to live downtown, well, that's part of the problem. This is part of the vicious cycle. Why is it so expensive to live downtown? In part because the taxes are high. Why are the taxes so high? Because we spend a million dollars subsidizing the suburbs. So why are the suburbs so inexpensive? It's because they're being subsidized by the people who live in the city. If you can cut out that um, subsidy and also build more housing in the city, right? give more opportunities for people to live in the city. And when they live in the city, uh, when you live in the city, you can, like I do, uh, sell your car, walk to work, get to how much money I save, they, 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 the estimate is, on average, Americans spend twenty dollars per day on a vehicle, between gas, insurance, the cost of the car front, and maintenance over the lifetime of the vehicle. If you can save twenty dollars a day, that's six hundred dollars a month. Add that to what you're paying in rent now. All of a sudden, your your cost of living is now changed. So if we can bring people in, we can actually bring their costs down and allow them to live more money. So that's two two. Uh leverage points, uh, user fees and polluter pays type legis legislation. Miranda? Um, I wanted to, to put in one last plug for carbon tax. Um, and I'm not going to say a whole lot because I think the best resource is if you are interested, curious about carbon tax, please go to citizensclimatelobby.org. Um, wonderful resources for answering all of your questions. Um, uh, and also, we do have a thriving local chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby that meets monthly. So you can chat with me if you're interested. Um, but all of these comments that keep coming up, I'm like, yeah, yeah, carbon tax, we could address that. We, we're addressing that, we're addressing that. Um, I think one of the, um, it, it does internalize the cost. The idea would be to tax um, all fossil fuels across the entire economy at their point of uh, when, when they, um, you know, being drilled out of the ground and everything, um, at the point of, I'm sorry, what? Entry. Um, but the, those costs, uh, they get passed on to the consumer at the gas tank. Um, but what's neat about the carbon tax that Citizens Climate Lobby is pushing for is that all of that revenue would get returned to consumers, to households equally. Um, and so you would be able to uh, afford the rising cost of gas at the tank and the rising cost of food at the grocery store. Um, and so the people who are paying, end up really paying for this tax are the fossil fuel industry, the, the, the energy producers. Um, and what it does is it levels the playing field. The tax would continue to rise until the playing field is leveled such that renewables are the things that everybody says, oh, I'm gonna invest in that instead because fossil fuels are, are a dying thing. Um, and then the, the, the other piece that I'll mention is that it's also a wonderful way to re-engage positively in, uh, with democracy because the activities that us citizens, the Citizens Climate Lobby, this army of citizen volunteers across the country are being trained to do this, we are learning to lobby, to meet with Tom Reed. Um, that's what we're doing this month in Washington. Um, uh, and to write op-eds, as Sarah said, uh, to do it in a respectful way that doesn't treat them as the other, but meets them where they're at and says, and says um, so for the first few meetings you, you meet with them, you find out where they're coming from. Not so that you can get ammo to like hold it against them, but to say, um, I just want to tell you about this carbon tax legislation that we're going to be introducing in 2015. Here's why I think it is totally relevant to your interest in national security and your interest in, in, um, in job creation. Um, and, and can you tell me what reservations you have such that you might not want to support a carbon tax? Let's talk about that. You know, um, it's very respectful. It's gotten me so excited to be involved in government, to be involved in lobbying. And there's the other piece that you can tell your students is it's not just sidewalks. It's not just, um, it's not just that the police are doing a good job. It's also that there's a place for me to meet my legislator face to face and feel good about it and experience him or her as a human being who is not monstrous, but is coming from his own particular set of um, excitements and constraints, just like I am. So thanks, Miranda. Uh, who hasn't? Reed hasn't. And then Sasha in the back. Sorry, Sasha. I didn't. Reed and then Sasha. Hey, my name's, ooh, hi. Um, hi, my name's Reed, I have a cold. My voice sounds funny to me, myself as I'm hearing myself talk. Um, so as, as we're talking about um, 
government accountability and addressing um, fossil fuel use at the federal levels and through institutions like government, um, I just wanted to pitch an open letter that was called Open Letter from the Grassroots to One Sky that was written by a number of grassroots um, indigenous, climate justice, and environmental justice, and economic justice organizations in 2010 when the last climate bill failed. And that was a climate bill that I made phone calls to voters in Kansas to try to get them to call their you know, representatives to vote um, on the Waxman-Markey bill. Um, so just, you know, I think absent of this conversation, uh, absent from the conversation has, so far has been those who work in the fossil fuel industry and are impacted by the extraction and the government's responsibility to justly transition our social structure um, so that those folks aren't left behind. Um, and so that we are accountable to the resources we have extracted from and, and benefit from. And, and I think that's fundamentally what is a matter of public good, right? Of all of us recognizing that we are collectively participating in a system by virtue of being a part of it, right? And then choosing to do something to sort of make reparations for those extra for, for extraction and um, transition. So that was just a quick pitch I wanted to make. Op uh, open letter to the grassroots, uh, open letter from the grassroots to one sky. Excellent points, Reed. Uh, can we get the microphone over to Sasha, please? Got one. Oh, she has yeah, I'm Sasha Paris, and this talk, especially the mention of uh, internalizing the damages that are currently being done with impunity, more or less, uh, just to set the stage, reminded me of what Jared Diamond relayed statements uh, by some big corporations in relation to the toxic messes they leave behind, basically them saying, we're not charities, we're not going to do anything for the good of anyone but our profits unless we're forced to, which sounds on the face like legislation, regulation would be the way to go, but I get the sense that's sort of a bully going, you know, make me, and then doing everything they can to uh, prevent that. So it's a tricky dynamic trying to get government uh, to address that when they're <coughs> fighting against it with m money or smear campaigns or both. They can't pay every single one of us off to that same extent, although you could say low prices or media campaigns are sort of paying us off, but just it's going to need to be tackled from a few different sides at once. And of course, what you're talking about, this question of between generations, we didn't have time tonight to, to get into that very deeply. but. There are a lot of people who have been thinking about uh, our obligation to future generations and, and people who feel that we can perhaps address this problem of the scarcity mindset and then <coughs> therefore the scramble and the sharp el elbows by adopting a more of an ecological mindset about living on this planet and how, to, how the human race needs to um, <coughs> figure out how to be in balance with that planet. Um, I want to uh, remind everybody that in two weeks from tonight is a, the <coughs> final salon, and it is about, um, is it up to the people? Uh, and uh, tonight's conversation has clearly pointed us in that direction of our roles as voters, as taxpayers, as members of a community. And uh, the panels will be Miranda. And, uh, and Reed and myself talking about citizen level action, um, citizens climate lobby, lobby. Um, Reed's work with the Tompkins County Climate Protection Initiative and, and other you know, uh, movements that he's involved in. Um, and um, I'm so grateful for all of you coming here tonight. It looks like Irene really wants to say something, so why don't you just jump in before we, before we end. <laughs> uh, thanks, and so this is, this is dovetailing a bit on what Reed said, um, in some ways also looking to uh, citizen action, and it's a local issue that I know many people in here are at least somewhat familiar with, which is the issue of the Cuga power plant. 
And, and in so many ways, that brings home a lot of the issues that we've been talking about in this forum, which is um, it's a very challenging situation that we have. We have, we have a power plant that's looking to quote unquote repower using so-called natural gas, methane, <laughs> um, fracking gas. Um, and I, my assumption is that many people in this room would, would not find that an, accessible, uh, 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 an acceptable alternative. On the other hand, we have another very real situation that brings home uh, some of what Reed mentioned, which is the just transition concerns. There are 60 jobs in Lansing that would be lost if that plant closes. Um, there are people in Lansing who will have um, significant impacts to their taxes and, and particularly their school taxes. These are real concerns. Um, I'm of the opinion, and I, and I hope that many of you are too, that, that we need to look to find solutions that allow us to move forward um, away from a natural gas or methane gas fire, uh, solution and continue to support Lansing as well. And, and it's a real challenge um, when, we, when we start looking at any kinds of transitions and moving in the name of public good and individual rights, there's got to be a way for, for there to be winners all. Um, because otherwise, we can't leave people behind in this and we can't leave Lansing behind. And to that end, this is bridging into being an announcement, on June 30th, uh, we'll be having a uh, educational forum at the Unitarian Church uh, to talk part one about what, what actually is going on with the Lansing Power Plant. There's been a lot of misinformation, a lot of misunderstanding. So part one will be that, and part two will be to talk about what are some possible real world solutions for Lansing. So, so I would like to invite people to come to that and to spread the word about that on June 30th. But even if you can't come, that, that's a real situation that, that I think drives home the complexity of moving forward, and I'd like people to contemplate that too. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. <laughs> Did anybody else have an announcement of an upcoming event to make? Yeah, uh, Anna, Nick, and Bob and Jean. I'll just go super quick. Um, I am uh, working with the Green Resource Hub. Um, with, there are a couple people here, um, Maribeth, Ed, Bob, Gay. And um, one of the things that we talk about being able to do is supporting local businesses so that we have local businesses, so that we don't have to go to businesses that are franchises. And one of the things that we've started to do was to um, host cash mobs. So for those of you who haven't heard, they're flash mobs with money, um, like everybody shows up and dances in a place. Um, so this is everybody shows up and there's music and refreshments and you spend 20 bucks. <laughs> So, um, and you support a local business, give them a boost. And on this Sunday from two to five, we are going to be um, hosting a cash mob at Bloom on the Commons. And a lot of people think it's just a kid's store and a kid's playhouse in the back, but I am wearing the gorgeous clothes <laughs> all of Bloom for women. And it is all made in the United States. And a lot of the women's clothes are, clothes are made locally. A lot of the... Um, the kids' toys are made locally, so it's pretty freaking awesome, and I encourage you all to come two to five to support a local business. So. That's great. Can we get a microphone to Mike, uh, to Nick? Nick has a mic, thank you. <laughs> the Sustainability Center uh, has no director currently. We are looking for a talented, passionate person to serve as <clears throat> director. Uh, officially, the first deadline for applications is tomorrow. I realize that's kind of short notice. Um, but we are accepting applications on a rolling basis after tomorrow. So I encourage you to uh, check it out and hopefully apply. Thanks. Okay, and then to uh, Jean and then to Bob. Oh, she needs the mic. Uh, I just wanted to, one thing when I was talking about the CARP, well, I'm glad she, you brought up about the Citizens Climate Lobby. Yeah, the legislation or the kinds of legislation they want is what's called a carbon fee and dividend that gets away from that word tax. Um, and basically what that, that is um, the fee at the point of extraction, at the point of entry, and then there's a dividend that's given back to people, so you get rewarded if you're saving energy. Now, if you're low income, you need help saving energy because, it, you know, so that must never be forgotten, but that's the whole point. It's a carbon fee and dividend program that, that a lot of people like the Carbon Tax Center, the Citizens Climate Lobby, James Hansen and everything are all endorsing. 
Um, I just wanted to clarify that. I do have two announcements. Um, there are people in other counties fighting very hard. Um, there are two major things going on in Schuyler and Chemung County on Monday. In both cases, we're faced with legislatures who are, well, in the case of uh, Tom Schuyler County, they want to pass a resolution in favor of the liquefied propane gas facility, the proposed LPG facility. Um, they've also been expanding methane storage there. And that there's going to be a resolution adopted, I mean, I'm sorry, a resolution proposed to, to uh, support the LPG facility, which goes against what other counties and towns have done. Yates and Seneca along Seneca Lake have passed resolutions against the facility, and so have some towns. And that will be <laughs> in Schuyler County um, at 6.30 at the county, uh, the big county building, the courthouse. In Chemung County, the issue that they're facing, Monday, in fact, both of these are Monday, which is a problem in a way because they're opposite each other. In Chemung County, they're facing the question of expansion of a landfill. The reason why they want to expand, expand the damn landfill is so that they can accept um, drill cuttings from fracking. And so <clears throat> the people in Chemung County are fighting against that, and the people in Schuyler are fighting against the LPG facility, both of which these sorts of projects are all things that sort of build out the fracking infrastructure. You know, they make, New York may not adopt fracking, but we'll still end up providing support services the way it goes. I um, mean, we have Schlumberger which, in Chemung, which provides support services. So in so Chemung County- Can you, the, uh, can you just say when, the when and the where? So yeah, sure, in Chemung County, going. it's at the, in, it's on the, this, the city, uh, on, on Lake Street in Elmira, um, People will be talking before, I believe it's the, at the Chemung legislature, and in Schuyler, it's, uh, it's, it's at the county courthouse, which is on Route 9, um, Route 9 in Watkins Glen, I mean, the 9th Street in Watkins Glen, off Route 14. Um, I just want to say one other thing. L FDR coined it very well, what we're facing. Fascism, fascism is corporate control of government. So we are dealing with fascism. Thank you. Thanks, Jean, and Bob. And then Chris, you wanted to make one, one last and then we're done, all right? Hi, I'm Bob Rossi. I'm the director of the Sustainable Enterprise and Entrepreneur Network, which is a local business network with a shared belief that business, if done right, can has a, have a positive impact on our community and our natural environment. Uh, we host events throughout the year. Anna spoke of one event that's this weekend. I want to tell you about our event. Yeah, Bloom is a scene member and that's uh, what inspired that. Um, I want to tell you about our event on June 26th. That's a Thursday. That's, that's three weeks from right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll be celebrating Finger Lakes food and learning how we and our businesses can unite to support renewable energy solutions. I can say in this room that this is at its core an anti-fracking event. But our format and especially all of our marketing is very solution oriented. We're highlighting Finger Lakes food at, as an example of what's at risk. And we're, we're we are <laughs> highlighting renewable energy solutions as a very logical and increasingly feasible alternative uh, to help reduce our dependency on fossil fuels. Uh, hope to see you all there. That's 6 p.m at Green Stars The Space um, on Thursday, June 26th. 6 p.m., thank you. And Chris, can you hand him the microphone? Here. Well, I, I just want to make a little pitch about public media, public television, public radio. What we do at Shell Shock Media, we are trying to take your voices and get that <coughs> out, right? Get this conversation going, okay? We would like to partner with public broadcasters. And what I'm asking each of you to do is to, you know, when you make your calls or emails to your program directors, your news directors, your public stations, try to engage. I mean, it's good for them to, uh, to hear us when we, are, when we are really mad at times. A lot of that anger has been directed against NPR. We're going to think about how we can engage 
what they can do, what we would like them to, what we want them to cover. And now is especially, with WSKG license renewals coming up soon, now is especially good time. But there are good people that work there. So that's just, I agree with all. If something comes up, you know, if, if, if it's the Chemung County uh, legislature meeting, you know, if it's, uh, you know, over the, the landfill issue, uh, if it's the, uh, the issue here with the, which is actually for the whole area with the Cuga Power, let them know. Let them know what, what kind of coverage you want. Good point, it, excellent point. Well, we're gonna wrap it up. Just to remind you all, there are finished baskets by the door. Wow. Really the um, <laughs> and uh, good stuff. And uh, because this kind of programming can't happen without your support. Absolutely, that, that's an absolute truth. I want to just uh, end by thanking all of you. This was a really good conversation tonight. I really appreciated just the ground that we covered. And of course, we, we didn't have time in two hours to, to go as deep as we would like to. But I'm hoping that what comes from this is your own interest in carrying these conversations into your world, into your homes, into your workplaces, hanging out with your friends, your neighbors, to get a lot more people really spending time digging into this together because that I think is, is how it gets into our hearts uh, and not just a headline that we read. And then maybe that's how we end up taking responsibility, all of us, not just waiting for a few people to you know fix it for us, waiting for Barbara to fix it for us. <laughs> And I, lastly, a round of applause for our, our respondents tonight. I hope you all come back in two weeks, two weeks from tonight. Same time, same place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.